I'm George Curtis. Welcome to It's Your Law. Each week it's my privilege to bring guests that talk about the law, educate all of us about the law. We don't always agree, but we learn something about the law and how it is developed, legislated, enforced or not enforced, and the impacts that we anticipated from our legal effort, and then those that really happen, which are sometimes quite different. It's a privilege to have people from all political parties and all views on this show. The fact that I invite somebody here does not mean that I agree or he agrees with everything each other thinks. It means that he's willing to have a discussion, and I'm willing to listen, and I hope you are too. My guest today is somebody I've known a long time. He's a representative in our state legislature, has been, I think, since probably 2012. He's a neighbor wherefore my kids were raised. He's an owner of Leon's, the soft ice cream and juice burger restaurant on Murdoch Street in Oshkosh. And my kids swear whenever they come to town, they go over there for a juice burger. And I don't doubt it. It's Mike Schraw, and welcome to the show. Good morning, George. Well, tell us uh, your title uh, and uh, who you represent. Well, I'm the state assembly representative for the 53rd assembly district. Um, as you know, there are 99 state assembly positions in the state, 33 Senate seats. Our position runs for two years, two-year terms. Uh, I was elected November 2012, so inaugurated January 1st or 3rd of uh, 2013. This is my 11th year. Um, my district is pretty much everything around the city of Oshkosh, so the northern part is the town of Oshkosh. And then going south from there, I have the town of Black Wolf, and I know I'm going to forget a couple, um, town of Nakaimai, town of Friendship. Uh, I go into North Fond du Lac is my district. And then going west, uh, I also um, represent Rosendale, town of Rosendale, town of Waupon, uh, village of Waupon. Uh, and then a little bit farther north uh, and going west uh, with redistricting, now I represent Winnicani, town of Winnicani, town of Poygan. And then I also have Omro, town of Omro. Um, I know I'm going to forget a few more in here. Town of Utica, town of Algoma. Um, I'm picturing a son circle. of Rushford. Okay. <laughs> a circle of people. Uh, all around Oshkosh, but not Oshkosh. Right. The Oshkosh is uh, Lori Palmieri's district, the 54th Assembly, um, which was currently held by Gordon Hintz. All right. And um, about 60,000 people I represent. And that's interesting. That, that's quite a mixture of people. What? Do you have a minute to tell us what got you into politics? Uh, well, it goes back to 2010-2011, uh, and uh, Jim Doyle was uh, the governor at that time, and as a small business owner, a bunch of my costs went up. Um, the tipping fees tripled, and a lot of taxes, uh, different taxes went up. And the state, in my opinion, was just not headed in the right direction. I was never really super political, um, never really identified myself uh, as a strong conservative or uh, a Republican, really. I, I voted occasionally for the best person. Um, and, you know, it was one of those things that um, I, uh, I ended up putting up a couple signs. I put up a sign for um, Scott Walker and Ron Johnson. I knew Ron Johnson is a small business owner, and I I felt that the founding fathers were small business owners, and and they went to Washington to affect some change, and then they went back to their uh, businesses, and that's what I really liked about him. I didn't know anything about Scott Walker, um, but uh, I chose him after researching a little bit, and I received an email on a Friday afternoon um, from someone that said. I don't like the fact that you have those two signs up in your at your business. Um, I want you to take them down or I'm going to put a boycott out on your business. And I'm not going to mention the person's name, but I thank him for 
uh, actually doing that. I emailed them back on Monday and I said, you know, I, I love your passion. I said, but as a small business owner, if I don't stand up and make my voice heard, then shame on me. And I'm going to keep the signs up because that's my First Amendment right to support whoever I want. And a lot of businesses don't do that. A lot of businesses kind of back away from anything political. And typically, I'd let anybody put a sign up at my business if they came and talked to me and I liked their politics and I liked their ideas. Um, and that it just kind of grew from there. The person did put out a boycott on my business. Um, I stayed quiet about it. This was all during Act 10 when there were 40, 50,000 people in Madison protesting. And um, my business actually uh, went up. Uh, my sales went up because it started to leak out. And people don't like it when businesses get boycotted for no particular reason. And um, I was nudged into running for state assembly. And at a meeting, I went home and I looked at my wife and I said, they want me to run for state assembly. She goes, I think you should do that. What is that? I didn't know really the difference between state assembly and state senate. So then I just started doing a lot of uh, homework and I watched Wisconsin Eye and all the floor sessions and started getting the lingo and kind of understanding politics. And I knocked on 12,000 doors uh, that eight month period before the election. Um, it was currently held by an individual and uh, he decided to retire. Um, so it opened it up for a primary. There was a three way primary. The one person that ran against me worked for Tom Petri for 10 years, and the other person was a state treasurer uh, in the state of Wisconsin. So I was the underdog. Nobody gave me a shot, uh, but I outworked them all. I knocked on 12,000 doors, and I won the primary by 61%, and the rest is history. It's a very conservative district. It's probably 57 58% uh, Republican district, and... The last election that I had an opponent, I won by 69%. So. What a wonderful story. I, I differ with the politics of the two people that you were supporting. Right. Uh, but I so strongly believe in what you did. And not only your right, but your duty to say, this is what I believe. Right. Like it or leave it. This is a democracy and I have a right to take my ideas to the public and let them decide. I have known you for quite a number of years, I right. would guess 20 or more, and that's the kind of a guy you are. Yeah. And uh, we're going to take a short break, and when we're coming back, we're going to talk a little bit about your career and a special emphasis you have in prison and prison reform, right. and I think this is such a hot subject. We'll be right back. Welcome back to It's Your Law, Representative Mike Schra and I are talking this morning on a very busy day. He's got to get over to Winnicott County to be in a parade, but he took the time to be here and he has some very strong, well thought out views on some subjects that I think are the number one subjects in our state and in our country. We're talking about crime, punishment, prison, taxpayers, and how we stop and reverse the things that are going on in this country and throughout the world when it comes largely from drugs. Take it from there. Well, the 53rd Assembly District has eight correctional facilities in it. And I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't know anything about the prison system before I was elected and kind of just got thrown into the, uh, the ring and had to learn it because I have a lot of constituents that are correctional officers. Um, I have toured, we have 39 uh, state facilities, correctional facilities, and that's max, medium, and minimum security uh, facilities, uh, youth facilities. Uh, I've toured about half of them. And so I became the chair of the corrections committee. And uh, just over the last 11 years have just learned a ton about um, uh, criminal justice, criminal justice reform, and the cost, as you said, that uh, it costs taxpayers, uh, the effect that it has on society uh, when we lock people up. And I've learned about 
childhood trauma, um, how it has affected brain chemistry and wiring of the brains for people that have had trauma early in their lives. Um, and really have, have just loved being the chair of the corrections committee. Um, we spend a lot of money on corrections. Um, $1.3 billion every year, so about 2.6, 2.7 every two-year budget. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of uh, ideas that could have saved uh, the state a lot of money that some of them have been implemented and a number of them haven't been. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of bills right now that will be coming before my committee uh, in the summer, we have what's called the Ledge Council Study Committees, and I was on one last summer, and out of that committee, uh, we have four or five bills that will be coming out, and one of them is a reentry bill, and an individual that was in the system uh, actually came and testified in front of our committee, and he said, you know, when individuals get out, they don't know what to do, and this is what we need to have happen. We need to have a central um, re-entry location where they can get help with housing. They can get help uh, opening up a bank account and getting a driver's license. Otherwise, they're going to recidivate. If they don't have these things in place, um, they're going to get frustrated and they're going to do something that is going to get them sent back. And that's just costly to the taxpayer. So that's one of the bills I'm excited about. Um, we'll be hearing that bill uh, in September when we start our fall session. Uh, another bill is a ERP, a Earned Release Program. So right now the state has an Earned Release Program for drug addiction. And uh, individuals that were not involved in a violent crime uh, can go and actually get time taken off of their sentence if they complete a 20-week program. Uh, and here in the area, it's DAC, uh, Drug Abuse Correctional Center, out by Winnebago. So what we have proposed is doing an earned release program for people with vocational skills. Um, everybody knows that the workforce, uh, we, we have a shortage of workers, and there are a lot of individuals that are going to be um, released from the prison system over the next three to five years. And so what we're proposing is if they would end up getting a, uh, a vocational degree, going and learning brick making, welding, um, there's a dozen things that they can learn in prison. Um, we have teachers from the techs go into the facilities and actually teach automotive, um, carpentry, all of these skills, these vocational skills. Um, and if they do that uh, for a period of a time, um, I th and I think it's about a year to 15 months, um, and they get a degree out of that, uh, then they can get time taken off of their sentence and get out early and actually become productive members of society again. So those are two of the bills that we're real excited about um, from the Ledge Council Study Committee hearing. I think that is great progress. I remember when early in my career I did a lot of criminal work and so I've been in jails and prisons hundreds of times yeah. only once as a convict but I learned something that time too yeah. uh, and I don't think our system really has worked no. it has been so expensive so punitive yeah so punitive against the employers of these people, against the families of these people, resulted in many millions of millions of dollars of welfare, broken families, fracturing Absolutely. the next generation. Yeah. And Wisconsin has been the most locked up state in the most locked up nation in the world. And all we've proved is you have said is it has not worked. No. And we, we spend so much money, but we're so short-handed in the prisons that there really aren't the programs needed for rehabilitation. You know, we, we send them to prison and lock them up, and it's just kind of a, a storage uh, facility. And, um, you know, we can talk about that next, uh, um, the, the wages and how we get more people working in the, in the Department of Corrections. 
Um, but it's sad because you've got individuals that have committed some hor- some very horrific crimes. Others, um, you know, you or I could have been in that system, you know, if it wasn't for, you know, a break that we got somewhere. And uh, th- there really isn't a lot of reform that happens uh, or programming that they get um, to help them when they get out. Um, and part of that is just because we're so shorthanded uh, in corrections. Nobody wants to go into that um, that career anymore, that industry. And um, so it's frustrating uh, because you see these individuals get out and uh, within six months, a lot of them recidivate and they're right back in the system. And it's just the cycle. And as you said, it costs all of us tremendously. Let's take our second break. And when we get a chance, we'll come back in just a minute or so and talk about the, the solutions that you're working on. All right. We'll be right back. Welcome back to It's Your Law. George Curtis here and Representative Mike Schra, and we're talking about prisons, seemingly the biggest industry in our state, the most expensive industry in our state, and it's going in the wrong direction. We have more people locked up than percentage-wise than any other state in the Union, and it's not working. It's not working for the prisoners. It's not working for their families because there's nobody there to bring in a check. It's not working for the taxpayers because they're picking up the slack where there should be another wage earner in the family taking care of it. And now you're telling me it's not working for the staff either. Tell us about that. Well, the Department of Corrections has about 10,000 employees. And out of that, uh, there are about 4,500 that are in security. So correctional officers, Mm -hmm. sergeants. Um, There is such a shortage of workers right now uh, that the average vacancy rate is about 31%. Um, And that means they're just short um, the number of employees that they should have in the facilities. Waupun Correctional in Waupun is a maximum security prison. It's the third oldest prison in uh, the United States, the oldest prison in Wisconsin. I think it was built in 1859, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Right now, they're operating with a vacancy rate of 53%, which means that they have less than half of the employees that they should normally have. And that's not good. Um, Individuals are working an eight-hour shift. They're getting jammed or forced into another eight-hour shift. They go home and sleep. Uh, For a few hours, they come back and work eight hours, and they're forced into another eight-hour shift. So they're working two 16-hour shifts in a row. Uh, The average right now in the Department of Corrections uh, for uh, weekly hours is 72 hours um, that they're working. And it's killing families. um, It's killing individuals. Correctional officers have one of the highest suicide rates and divorce rates and uh, alcoholism related rates, uh, high PTSD. Um, So I have worked over the last, I want to say five, six years to try to get the wage uh, a little bit higher. A few budgets ago, the starting wage was um, 1603 an hour. And I got that raised to $19 an hour. And at that time, it was about a $2.40 an hour raise. And um, we were still lower uh, for pay for all the states that surround us. We were still the lowest paying state for our uh, correctional officers. And so this budget, I have just been hammering with my colleagues and hammering the people on joint finance and letting them know that we're in crisis in our facilities. And so I was able to actually uh, get a $13 an hour raise uh, for these individuals. It comes out to $344 million over the budget. It, it takes the starting wage from 2053 dollars up to $33 an hour. So now we are no longer at the bottom. Um, we're very competitive now with industry. And I think a lot more people are probably going to look at the Department of Corrections as a career. Um, we want good people in, in corrections because, um, you know, it, it, it's an important role. Um, people want to feel safe uh, from individuals that have committed horrific crimes. 
But then also when we're putting them in prison, we we want these individuals rehabilitated because 95% of them are going to get out at some point. And so this $13 an hour raise um, is going to help significantly. I've heard from hundreds of correctional officers so far. Uh, they're still kind of in disbelief that this is actually happening. It's got to go in front of the compensation committee and then it gets sent back to Joker, another committee. And uh, then it'll, it'll go into effect uh, as of July 1st, so they'll get back pay. Um, but it's a significant amount of money. Um, it adds, just with 40 hours a week worked, it adds about $20,000 onto an average correctional officer's salary. And so now, you know, we can get some quality individuals and recruit some, uh, some people that want to make the Department of Corrections their career. And then we're also hoping that it retains those veterans that have been uh, working for 15, 20, 25 years. And um, by filling up our workforce in corrections, um, that's going to help the individuals that are incarcerated because you're going to have a lot more programming that'll take place, um, which really isn't happening now because all of our facilities are so shorthanded. And it's, it's dangerous not only for the correctional officers that work there. There was just a staff assault at Oshkosh Correctional and the person was severely injured. Um, there was an a individual that was actually murdered up in um, uh, Green Bay Correctional about uh, four or five weeks ago. Um, it was an inmate on inmate assault and the, the other inmate was killed. Um, and that's a result of just being shorthanded. So I think this raise is going to be just significant. Um, and uh, it, it's going to be a game changer, I think. It'll bring more people in uh, to make Department of Corrections a career. And hopefully it'll keep those individuals that have the experience that have been there for a while. And uh, it'll get better. It will have better programming for... Uh, the people that are incarcerated in our prisons. And that's a win-win-win for taxpayers. Um, Couldn't agree with you more. Uh, there are many purposes for prisons. One is protection of the public right. from somebody who is truly dangerous. That's probably not 5% of the prisoners. One is punitive. So they learn their lesson, they don't do it again. But then we get into the other things, correction, which help them train to be better qualified to succeed right. and productive in our economy and in their families. And yeah. then there's rehab, so they can come out as missionaries like you are and say, let's folks, we can do this better and yeah. I can be help. I made a mistake. I paid my penalty, but let me make sure that you understand what you should do so your children don't make the same right. mistake. That's what the system is supposed to do. Right. And of course, all it really does is punish the taxpayer so far. Yeah, yeah, you're right, George. I, I, I admire so much you having this issue. I think it is incredibly important that people know that when they read of something in the paper and they're angry at the individual, that they think the world is going to be better if that person is locked up forever and uh, the key thrown away. They don't understand the cost yeah. of using that approach and the cost to the family and the children and everybody else that's involved in that family. I, I, th I think what you do is great work. I think it's great you came here this morning. You go to that Winnet County Parade. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, George. Keep up the good work. Thank you. We'll be right back. I agree with Representative Shra, and I applaud what he's trying to do for all of us. Let's really put corrections back into corrections. At one time, it was about education, rehab, probation, preparation to do a better job when you got out, good time and even a pardon in extreme circumstances. It's been going in the other direction. 
Governor Walker didn't even have a pardon. He didn't have a pardon board. He didn't have a single pardon during all the time that he was in. And of course, the real victims are the crime victim, the families of both the crime victim and the perpetrator, the perpetrator's employer, the taxpayers who are paying for this entire ridiculous, unworkable failure farce. Think about it and contribute your experience in life. There is hope, even for the taxpayer. I'm George Curtis, and that's my opinion.